Hello, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Nate Nelson, and um, we're here today to talk about database performance tuning. So if, uh, so if you guys were hoping to get something good out of a presentation, you came to a good one. I didn't only pick this presentation because it's useful to know as developers. Um, I chose it because it's one of my favorite things to do. I started out working with uh, ColdFusion and SQL Server about nine years ago. And um, the last five years or so, I kind of turned more towards being just strictly just a DBA. And since then, since then that's all I've done is database consulting and um, development DBA work. And it's really helped me coming from a development background, working with ColdFusion and ASP and whatever those are. It's really helped me a lot understanding both sides of the fence when it comes to working with the database. Because most, most DBAs only, stand, only understand one side of it. They understand the administration, how the database works, but they don't really understand how it comes from the other side. They don't understand how it, how it works with the application, how to fix things within the application. And then being a developer, when you understand the database more, that's going to help you a lot too. It's going to help you understand how the database reacts to your queries. And that's what I'm going to cover today. This is an intermediate to advanced level. I'm assuming, that, um, I'm assuming that the most of you understand databases, have worked with them, have maybe have taken some of the previous presentations this week. Um, no basic queries. And what we're going to do is we're going to work on how to find a bottleneck in a database, fix that problem. And we're going to talk about indexes. And we're going to talk about some of the tools we use to do performance tuning. So by the raise of hands, how many, how many people here have ever worked with um, an execution plan or an explain plan in Oracle, MySQL, or SQL Server? Good. It's around 25% or so. That's really good. And the rest of you, if you haven't heard of it, it's going to become your best friend. It's going to become your best friend when working with queries. How many here have heard of um, trace, database tracing? So probably some of the same people that have worked with execution plans or explain plans has, uh, have also done database tracing. We're going to look at that here today, too. So what is performance tuning? Can anybody in the audience, audience give me an example of what database performance tuning is? Don't be shy. Yes? Exactly. It's a very broad, it's a very broad question. And she said, it's improving the query, improving the hardware, improving the way the database acts. It's a very broad topic. There's a lot to it. And to be honest with you, it takes someone very weird to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. But when it works, it's powerful. So identifying bottlenecks. What causes a bottleneck? What is a bottleneck? A bottleneck is just a term for a problem. It's, um, it's pretty common in most applications. You'll, I call, on a day-to-day -day basis, I may get someone calling me saying, our application is slow. That's all they say. They don't say, what's slow? They don't say, when I push this button in, on this page, it takes a while to come back to me. No user ever says that. If they do, then you're lucky. Because usually it's, my application is slow. So we're going to talk about how to figure that out. So when they say it's slow, that means there's a bottleneck somewhere. We're going to figure that out. The first thing you've got to do is think of what kind of things cause that. It's increased activity, large amounts of data, poor code, hardware. It could be a number of things. It could be 50 different things. So what you've got to do is collect as much information as you can, as you can at the beginning. Collect as much information as you can and try and find out how the database is used. Try and find out where the problem is. Try and find out where, what queries are taking the longest to run. Maybe there's some type of user blocking going on. Maybe it's a slow network connection. Maybe there's a hardware problem. Maybe the server's almost at a disk space. There could be a number of things. Maybe it needs more memory. So one of the things I want to talk about is actual query cost. If we're going we're to talk about how to actually use the SQL profile and run a database trace. 
and try and find where the slow running queries are. Now when you do something like that, you may find, you may find a really slow running query. Or you may just know that there's a slow running query at a certain time of day and this is what you think may be causing the problems. Now actual query cost, what I mean by this is there may be queries that take like a report. Someone runs a report and it takes an hour to come back. Is that the problem? Or is it the login script that checks for the login that takes 500 milliseconds, which is only a half a second, it doesn't seem like very long. But if it runs on every single page request 10,000 times a day, maybe that's the problem. That's what I consider actual query cost. Don't try and just fix, the, fix something because it's the longest running query. If it takes an hour to run and it's only at night, or if it runs during the day and it takes an hour to run, but it's only doing select information, it may not be doing a lot of user blocking, it may not be causing a problem. It may be a problem for that particular user, and yeah, that's something you gotta try and speed up. But some things do take a long time to return, depending on what kind of report you're doing. That's the common thing to try and performance tune is reports, because by common, those are the things that take the longest to run. And users use them and they hate sitting there waiting for them. So those do gotta be fixed, but sometimes there's nothing you can do about those. You can speed them up and make them as fast as you can, but when you're looking at overall database performance, the problem could be these really small queries just to select from a table or you know, something like that, just to select joining two or three different tables that takes one or two seconds to run on every single page request. One or two seconds is a big difference. Every second counts, every millisecond counts. You gotta try and get that query, if it runs on every page, you gotta get that query down to zero milliseconds. I mean, you gotta set high standards and you gotta try and make it fast. When most, when most everyone, until you're in an, at an advanced level, and sometimes even when you're in an advanced level, when you're running things and they come back like this, you think it's quick. You think it's quick. But when you actually look at it, and it's taken two to 300 milliseconds, either you look at the debug on your page, or you look at it within the, within the query, and you see it's taken two to 300 milliseconds, that's a long time for something that could be zero or five milliseconds. So one of the first things you're gonna do is create a plan of attack. Understand how the application is used. There's different ways of doing this. If you were lucky enough to be involved in the design of the application and working with the testing and the design process and the users and you understand how the application is used, that's gonna help you. But nine times out of 10, we don't. The last four or five years, I've really made a living of going into environments where I have no idea what they're doing. And they just call me just to go in and make something run faster. I have no idea what their application's about. I have no idea what kind of platform they run on. I have no idea what version they're on, what version of database system they're on. I have no idea what kind of application they use. If it's Cold Fusion, if it's desktop application. It could be Visual Basic, it could be anything. It's from a high level, it's all the same thing. Performance tuning from a high level, it's all the same thing. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what the details are as far as what language is it, what it is, or any of those kind of things. So you have to know how to find out how to fix your problem. Because you can't go in there and say, oh, well, it's, it's not cold fusion. You know, I, I can't do that. You can't do that. Because you're going to really limit yourself and it's going to hurt you. So you've got you to figure out how to handle these things. And what I say, I call it a plan of attack. So the first thing, like I said, is understand how the application is used. One way to do this, if you have no idea what the application is, where it comes from, what type of hardware it is, any of that stuff, use a database profiler. Whether it's Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, they all have it. They all have some type of trace mechanism. The way they run and the way you call them are different. I'm gonna, the demonstrations I'm gonna do today are on SQL Server. They all, have they all have their own types of trace mechanisms or explain plan mechanisms. In SQL Server, it's called SQL Profiler. We have a, and luckily it provides a nice little, tool, nice little GUI tool for us to look at to view it and run it. And we're gonna show how to use that. Doing this will allow you to collect exactly not only what kind of queries are run, but how it's run. If you see one query pop up you know, 500 times within a couple minutes, you run it for like a one hour period, you may see some really long queries that just pop in and out, and then everything starts to slow. All that information is gonna help you figure out what the problem is. 
you got to try and f collect as much data as you can beforehand. You know, ask, ask, because most, most nine times out of 10, the question is going to be, or the problem is going to be, my application is slow. The database is slow. That's the first thing they think of is the database is slow. That's the first thing they always blame. It becomes the scapegoat. The database is slow. So you've got to figure out, is it really the database? Is it a query within the application? Is it a network? Is it the hardware? And doing this profiler will kind of help you figure that out. Inside, inside the profiler, you can see data like CPU usage, IO usage, things like that. And that's going to help you try and figure that out. So when you collect the data, when you collect as much information as you can, you ask questions like, is it slow all the time? Is it slow during certain times of day? Is it slow during peak operations when there's more users? Or is it only slow at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. when this certain process runs? Let me tell you a little bit about a problem that I ran into around nine months ago, two years ago. There was a, one of my customers at the time, which is now, which is now the, pe the people that I work for full time. They were, they were having a problem they were having a problem with uh, one of their customer service, customer service departments where they had people would call in all the time and they would answer questions and they'd use this little application to go and, go and look people up. And um, there's only probably you know, 20 users, 20, 20 to 30 users using this application. So it's not a lot of users. But at a certain time of day, they would run this, this export that would send, send data to the state to tell them who was enrolled the day before. And it would grab some information from, from tables, insert it into another table, and then dump it out into a text file. And then it would FTP this text file off somewhere else. Well, unfortunately, they couldn't run the easiest answer is to say, oh, run it at night. You know, run it in the middle of the night. But unfortunately, in this case, they couldn't. It had to be run at this certain time of day. They had a certain window that was open from the state, and they had to do it. And the state didn't really care if it made your application slow or not. So what we did is well, what they were doing at the time to deal with it is they would just yell out across the customer service floor, everybody log off until this is done, and it may take an hour to finish. And if you think about it, if there's, say there was 100 people on this floor, and they take 10 calls an hour, and now they're down for an hour, you know, that's over 1,000 calls or more that, that's, not being, that's not being used now. That's ju they're just missing. So much productivity lost, and for no reason. And they lived like this for a little while. And finally, they asked me about it. You know, hey, we have this problem. First thing I did, what's the first thing some of you would do? Anyone? What's that? Hardware? That's a, good, that's a good one. You know, think about hardware. Maybe there's a problem with the hardware. But the first thing I would do when all I hear is there's a problem, were you going to say something? Yes, look at the queries. Now, the very first thing I would do is SQL trace. I would open up SQL Profiler and run a trace. This server was SQL Server 2000. So I would open up SQL Profiler and run a trace during this time span. Because the information I had at hand was during this time frame, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. or whatever time it was, we have to run this process. And it locks everybody out. Nobody can log in for the whole hour. So one way to do it is to go look at the queries. but. In this case, I couldn't do that because um, after talking with the developers that, that worked on this, I found out that this wasn't just one query. It was a series of queries. There was an application that actually went out and grabbed data so many times and then dumped into a text file. So looking at one query was going to take me a long time. And because this is a live production issue and this is causing a problem, I had to fix it fast. So the first thing I looked at was I ran a trace on it. And I ran a trace for this hour. And what I saw was you know, lots of queries, 10 to 20 different queries for every single member. And one member filled up one record of the file. And it may have only had, it only had like two or 3,000 records in the file. So it wasn't a real big file. So the problem wasn't that there was too much data going into the file. It wasn't necessarily that. The problem was there was this one query that kept popping up that took you know, 20 seconds to run, 15, 20 seconds to run. Which, if you think about it, that's not a long time. You know, 15, 20 seconds isn't a long time. But when you times it by like 3,000 members, 3,000 times this query is being called, and it was running for 15, 20 seconds every single time, that's the problem. So I looked at that query, and the query looked, the query had, 
a select statement. It was, it was getting out the data to put it into a table. So it was selecting from a table, and it said where this, where this filled in. And then in the end, it had another subquery that was selecting all. It was selecting star from another table. So the first thing I did was I looked at that table. And I found out that table had 60 million rows in it. And it was being selected all every single time on that query. Bingo, that's, that's a big problem. But there's more to it than that. Yes? Yeah, a no lock, is, a no lock would definitely help because that would keep it from being locked. Um, no, if I step back a second, the reason why no one could log into this application was because it was causing locks. Um, if we don't, unfortunately, we don't have time today to talk too much about locks, but every time you select data, insert, update, delete data, it causes a lock on a table. And in this case, they had to also update each record to flag it and say that it was sent to state. So it was doing an update, which causes an exclusive lock. And it was locking this table during this entire process. So no one, and unfortunately it was the biggest table of the application, the most used table of the application. So no one could log in the application and do anything with it because they had to wait until this lock was released. Now the thing about locks is you can't really avoid locks. There are ways to avoid locks using hints, like what Chaz mentioned is using a no lock. You can use a no lock on certain things only on like selecting data, things like that. And it's not a recommended operation because it can cause a dirty read, it can cause it to select the data out while it's being updated. It can cause a problem. But if you're doing like a report information, like some type of reporting query where you don't necessarily need up to the second, you don't really care so much about if there's a millisecond's worth of, of dirty data, you know, that's a good way to do it. Um, in this case, because this, the, the best way to fix locks is to speed up the process of, that's causing the lock. If you make the lock release as quick as it possibly can, then, it's gonna make, then it's the lock's not going to be a problem. Locking is nothing we can really avoid because a locking is what a database engine uses as its mechanism to control, control concurrency. And there's no way to really avoid that. You have, to have, you have to deal with it. So the way to do it is to make it run quick. Make the lock release as fast as you can. And in this case, because it was involved in one big process where it was running this query that take 20 seconds, two or 3,000 times, the first thing I noticed was that it was in that in, that subquery, it was selecting all from the 60 million row table. So one way to fix that, there's two ways to fix it. You can fix it with a join if the situation's right. The way I fixed it was to replace the in with an exists. Has, any, has anybody here heard of the exists? Good, so around half. Exist is an operation that, you can, that is commonly used to replace in. I try and avoid in as much as I can unless it's like three or four or five different values, then in is pretty useful. But exists, all it does is you just say, select, select whatever from the table where exists, and then inside there you do your operation, and it's gonna, if that is true, then it's gonna make the query true. So it only checks, it doesn't actually return all the data. And then on top of that, I didn't say select star from, I just did select you know, the record from this table where that ID, like for in this example, it was like a, a member ID, where the member ID equals, and then I would say, I would scope it with this table name dot member ID. So then it would join back to the main, to the main tape, the main query, and it would only check it for that one record at a time. That alone was fixed half the problem. What's another problem that may have still, so even after I did that, it still took 10 seconds to run this one query. Index, very good. This table had no index on it. So the first thing I did, I just ran an execution plan to see exactly what, what was being called out of it. And I saw, you know, there was no index being used. So what I did is I added an index on the table that was in my subquery on member ID. And when I did that, now it was doing an index seek and it was running lightning fast. It took like five milliseconds to run that one query. And the whole process went down to three seconds. The entire thing went down to three seconds from an hour. So now they could run this state, send a state problem you know, at nine in the morning, it didn't matter. It didn't matter how much peak the user activity was. The whole thing was done. It ran through the 2,000 members, set, set up the text file, whatever, within five seconds tops. 
So now this locking problem that was causing everybody to log out was now no longer a problem because it was over so fast no one even noticed it. And the whole thing took me like four hours to fix. See how simple that is when you think about it? From the beginning, beginnings of it, it sounds like a huge problem. But once you get down to it, it's really pretty simple. You know, a problem with a simple inquiry. It was the most simple statement. A problem with a simple inquiry and no, and no index. Pretty easy, right? Boy, it makes you feel like a hero when you do something like that. You know, it makes it totally worth it. But you've got to be a geek to think like that. You've got to be kind of weird to think like that. So one way, another way to do this is to, what, the one thing you've got to do all the time, performance evaluation checklist. Consider everything and remember that bandages always fall off. There are some times when you know you only have four hours to do something and you can't fix the whole problem. So you've got to put a band-aid on, but you've got to remember they do fall off and you've got to fix the real problem so you don't have to use band-aids. Fixing the real problem sometimes can be quicker than fixing all the, individu all, the, all the symptoms. Because if I would have worried too much about blocking in this case, and maybe I would have thought, oh, there must be a problem with the memory on the server. There must be a problem with the, the hard disk because it's taken too long to create the text file. You know, something like that. I could have went off on a wild goose chase, and it could have taken me forever. But you try and figure out what the real problem is. And the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. Here's some examples. You know, this isn't a perfect example to use for your checklist. You'll make your checklist based off what type of environment you're in. You know, what, if it's web-based, if it's application-based, depending on how many users use it, that kind of thing. Slow network communication. Lack of or out-of-date statistics. Statistics are something used by the database to figure out if it needs to use an index or not. It usually keeps this autom updated automatically, but every now and then you've got to update these. So that's involved too. Table or index fragmentation. Unfortunately, when you create the index, that's not the end of the story. You have to keep that index maintained now, too. And we'll talk about that also. Indexes get fragmented, and then they start to lose their luster. Um, lack of useful indexes. Like what I mentioned before, that table did have indexes on it. It just, unfortunately, didn't have an index on the, on the field that was being used in the query. Inadequate memory. Memory is a very common problem if you're using you know, SQL Server 2005, for example, it needs at least a gig, of, a gig of memory on a server. It's best to put it with at least two gigs of memory. You know, if you have less than that, that's a common problem. It's an easy way to fix it. Storage issue, you know, partitioning or striping, this, this could be a problem too. Where's the data stored at? Is it stored in, is the server a, an old PC that's converted and has an, a server operating system on it? and the hard disk is really bad, or it's an external hard disk that costs 50 bucks at Best Buy. You know, maybe it's something like that. That causes a big difference, too. And when I say striping, you know, when you, when you have a server with a disk array, you know, work with your server team. Get to know your server team. If, you, if you're one of those guys that wears a lot of hats and you have to do this yourself, you know, look into RAID configurations. This has a lot to do with how the data is returned. It, and it provides higher availability, and it also makes things run faster, too. If you do have a server team, you may not know what I'm talking about. Go talk to the server team, be friends with them, find out how they build their database servers. You know, look up information on RAID configurations and what's best to use with the database server, because server guys usually don't know how databases work with it. They just want to make a powerful server. Sometimes it needs to be tweaked a little bit to work with the database. Unnecessary code. You know, code that runs too many times or code that doesn't need to be there. Like if, if you guys have used, you know, Fusebox or Mach 2 or some of these, some of the architecture methods, you may notice after you've built an application or if you're going into an application, you look at the debug, you may see the same queries pop up three or four times in one page. And then you realize, oh, I could have put that all into one query or I didn't need this second query. And part of that's because they're called from different pages and you may not realize one's being called or another. Try and avoid unnecessary code. That all adds up. Execution plans and database tracing. Like I said, all the main systems have it. Is there anyone here that uses DB2? Good, because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> now, SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, they all have execution plans and database tracing. They're used differently. They're called something different. Oracle and MySQL, it's called an explain plan. And Unfortunately, you don't have a nice little GUI to work with it. You have to 
put in your code, show explain plan. You know, look that up and you can find out how to do that. It's pretty easy. Database tracing, they all have tracing. SQL Server has a nice little GUI called a SQL Profiler. And we're going to look at that. You can do tracing a few different ways. You can do it by using the GUI. You can do it by calling some system store procedures to pr create the trace output. We'll do that too. Oracle and MySQL, you turn on what's called a trace flag. You turn a trace flag on and set the output to go to a file, and you can read that file later. These are going to be your best friends when doing performance tuning. The profiler, this is the first thing we're going to look at. This is the best way to understand how the database is used, unless you were lucky enough to be involved in the design of the database and you know all about it. But even if you were, you may not realize how the database is actually used. You may think that this one little thing you put hidden somewhere in the application wasn't used much. When you do a trace on it, you may, may see, whoa, that thing's popping up all the time, popping up everywhere. And the profile can be executed through the GUI or using stored procedures. We'll show how to do both of those. Here's some tips. Don't run from the server. They're fast and they will catch you. Actually, don't run the profiler from the server. Don't actually run from the server. It doesn't move. But the profiler, the profiler causes problems if you run that on the server. So don't run it on the server. Don't remote desktop in and run the profiler from the server. I've done that before. <laughs> And it's not a good thing. It, those files fill up quick, and it causes major performance issues. Unfortunately, I learned the hard way. Don't trace to a table. There's an option in here to trace the output directly to a table. This is a very powerful feature, because you can query this table and see the results better without actually having to look at this big, huge, long file. Well, don't trace it directly to a table. Save your results to a table. There's a way afterwards after the results are all done, you can save that to a table. Don't do the direct trace to a table because that causes a problem too. That actually causes a, a loopback function to the server when it's traced into your table. It connects the two databases together. So you don't want to do that. Limit the events traced. By events, you'll see what I mean when we open this up. Always use the trace stop time. The trace stop time is something that tells it to stop in one hour. Always use this because if you start one, Go to lunch, you know, a couple hours later, come back, it's been running for three, four hours. Everybody's complaining, why is, our, why is our server all slow all of a sudden? You realize, you, oh man, I had a trace running for the last three or four hours. You don't need that much data. You only need like an hour's worth tops. You know, if there's something, you know, that's running for a long period of time, you need to run it overnight. Maybe it takes longer. But use the trace stop time because it's so easy to forget that you have one running. There's a, something called a black box. The black box trace. Has anybody here heard of the black box trace? Good, good. Going to teach everybody something new today. There's a feature called a black box trace in SQL Server that allows you to open up a black box trace file that runs in the background. It only keeps five, me five megabytes of trace data at a time. You can turn this on during the middle of the night hours or whatever while something is running. And the biggest, fe biggest feature, biggest use of this if a server crashes and you need to find out what was running when that happened, that's not always easy to do. If you're using this black box trace in the middle of the night or whatever, you can open up this, this file. It's just like an airplane black box. That's why it's called a black box. It tells what was happening for the last five megabytes. You can open this, open this file. So we'll look at that and how to view it. So let's take a break now and look at some, look at some stuff. Okay, if you're going to do a database trace, you'll find this wherever your SQL Server installation is at. Mine's right here. If it's 2000, it's under your 2000 installation in your program files called Profiler. If it's 2005, it's set up a little bit differently. It's under Performance Tools and then SQL Server Profiler. Now, create a shortcut for this because this is something you'll use a lot. So I'm going to start a open profiler and start a trace. When you create a trace, there's going to be some default, default you first connect to the server you want to do. There's going to be some default templates in here. You can create your own template. Once you get everything figured out the way you want, you can save that as a template too. So in this case, I'm just going to grab everything 
And then um, in here, here's the trace stop time. This is what I was telling you about. You know, you want to set this to stop at a certain time, unless you're going to look at it real quick and you know you're going to stop it. You know, always set your trace stop time. You can save this directly to a file. This is a good idea because that doesn't cause any performance issues. You know, save that directly to a file and then you can open this file with, from SQL Profiler. There's another way to open it within the query, query tools too, and I'll show you how to do that. Here's the option I showed just save to table. Now, if, you want, if you're on like a test or development environment, you don't care so much about you know, affecting production environment, it is a cool option because it does, it does allow you to go back and look at it and see the data and everything. Sometimes it's pretty easy. Here's the event selection where I said limit the events. Um, you see right here I have login, logout, sessions, um, store procedure starting, and T-SQL batch starting. So this is going to record all of my logins and logouts, and it's going to record um, my procedures and my SQL batches. Now when I say don't use all the events, this is why. Because there's a lot of events in here. See how many? I mean there's just a ton. You can directly look at cursors. And there's all these different events on cursors. If you know the problems with the cursing, you need to trace that. You can do that. You can trace just logins. You can trace only locks. You can trace certain objects. You can trace, here's a way you can look at execution plans without um, inside your trace. You can open up performance and you can do your show plan, show plan stuff here. And this is going to actually output in the trace your, the execution plan that's being used for every process. This is a great way to see what's going on and maybe if you want to do something automated to pull out things that are causing full table scans or, or index, index usage missing. So once you, once you get your event selected, um, here's show all columns. There's all kinds of columns in here you can select for each one. Now it doesn't matter how many columns you select, that has no difference on performance. So once you, so just limit the amount of events you select at one time. Don't try and grab everything because this will just, it's hard to read and it'll, it could create an issue. When you're selecting your columns out, however, that doesn't make a difference. That just changes the amount of data that comes out. That's not going to make a difference on performance. So choose as many things as you can, you know, and then later you can limit the information. Now we'll run this. And you can see the output. So I have certain things running. See, like for example, I'm doing a trace, you know, and everything that's going to run on here is going to be shown. You can actually see all the output. Here's a connection. Here's um, my trace start where I just started the trace. So you can see everything that's running on here, you can actually see. You can see the details of it. You can see the start time and the stop time. And you can put other columns on here like duration and CPU usage. And you can look at, you can filter it too. So let's look at that real quick. So column filters. Here you can say, you know, like here, application name. If you're only looking for a certain application name, then you can change that here. If you want to run by duration and you only want to get queries that take longer than one second to run or five seconds to run, you can do that here. Duration greater than or equal to, and then this is by milliseconds. You can say 5,000 milliseconds, and this will give you every query that takes longer than five seconds to run. That can be very powerful. You can look for certain, database, certain usernames, certain databases. You can pretty much filter this any way you want. So and then once it's done, well, let me show you. So once it's done and you get the filters the way you want it, you get the events up the way you want it, you can do save as trace template and save that template and then later you can pull that up. You can save your results to a trace table and then you can query that table. All the columns that you've selected will be in there, and you can query that table based on those, and that'll help you find your results better, too. So I'm going to close this now. Oh, here's another cool thing, too. Um, here's an export option. Script trace definition for 2000 or 2005, those are different. You do this, and it's going to actually give you a .sql file 
that will call this trace from a set of stored procedures. It's going to look like this. This is actually the output created by the SQL profiler. So it'll create this. It has all your events selected in here. It has the location of the .trc file. The .trc file can be opened two different ways. It can actually be opened through the profiler GUI, or you can run a function, which I'll show you how to do that right here. You can run this function, fn get trace table. So if you do this on a .trc file, that's going to show up in the results. That's going to actually pull it up into your results, and you can view that. So there's an example of a trace file I had before. See all the details of that in there? It's pretty slick, right? So this already has all of your events that you selected in here. And the useful thing of this is this is something that you can set to run at a certain time of night. You can, you can take these outputs and you can schedule to run on a certain day and output it to a certain file for a certain period of time. You know, and that's going to help you find a problem too. So the black box trace. Now this is one of my favorite features. I actually had to use it the other night. We had a problem that was uh, we had something that was running in the middle of the night and it kept failing. It kept failing right at the last minute and it would time out and nobody could figure out why this was failing. And unfortunately, I didn't get any sleep on Monday night trying to help them figure this out. But using the black box trace had actually helped us a lot. Um, because this thing was causing all kinds of trace data. It was running for like, it was like a five hour process. It was running forever. So I couldn't really just run a trace on it the whole time and sit there and stare at it for five hours when I have no idea when it's going to end. So what I did is I used the black box trace. And what this is, is there is, using this procedure, SP trace create, there's um, an option on there. You set it to eight, and that's called the produce black box. It, it's, it's not undocumented. It's just not well known. You can look it up in your books online or your, your SQL help and just look for black box and it'll tell you how to start and run this and what it does. And it's going to actually create a black box.trc file in your default data directory where your data is stored. And, you can, and it's going to store five megabytes at a time, so it's not going to get too big. I don't recommend running this 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, but if there's a problem going on, you know, set it and use this kind of feature. So this, this code right here, this code right here will actually um, start the trace, get the trace flag. Every trace you start has, a set, has a, its own flag. You create, you get that ID, the trace ID, and then you set it to one, and that's going to start it. And by default, the black box trace just grabs everything, and it's just going to dump it into a file. So if we look, I have this running on my, on my machine. It's going to go wherever your default data directory is blackbox.trc. And you can open this up and see everything that was going on for those, that last five megabytes. Very useful. Okay, so before we go on to talk about indexing and execution plans, does anybody have any, any questions about the profiler and tracing? Yes? What was that question again? Oh, good question. On SQL 2000, you need, to have, you need to have it running from an account that has system administrator access. That kind of sucks because you know, you're not going to be able to do it if you're not a DBA or you don't have access to it. Um, in 2005, so you'll need to have someone run it for you. In 2005, there's a new database role that was created to allow people access just to run a trace. There's actually a trace role in, in there that will give you access to run a trace. Yes. Um, the Oracle equipment is just called it's just called setting a trace flag. So you turn on a trace flag, kind of like what I did with the stored procedures, and you set it to go to some file. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how to do that offhand. I've only had to do it once before. I haven't worked with Oracle a whole lot. Um, but if you, what's that? Yeah, there there might be some kind of feature built into Toad or some kind of user interface like that. But if you need to figure that out, if you use Oracle or MySQL, look up setting a trace flag on Oracle or tracing Oracle or tracing MySQL. That's what it's called. It's not called Profiler. Profiler is directly related to SQL Server. So if you just look up tracing, you'll see how to do it. And it's actually pretty simple. So writing efficient SQL, 
take the time to understand indexing. Indexing is very important. Always view execution plans. Don't always assume that you know what the database is going to do. You have a simple select or update statement, something like that. You think, oh, this is going to work fine. This is no problem. I'm just selecting this data from this table. This is simple. I'm just joining two tables together. Well, not so, because you don't know what indexes are on there. And even if you know what indexes are on there, sometimes it may use an index that you don't think it should. Or it may do something strange. Always use the execution plan output to see what it does. Don't get too overconfident and think that you always know what it's going to do. Always realize that there's more than one way to get the same results. Sometimes this decision can make or break an application. Sometimes it's something that you decide so far up that you can't really change it later on. Use caution with things like cursors, the in clause that I described before, and sorting, like group by and order by. Use caution on these things. Now, I'm not saying don't do them because you have to do them, but use caution on them. Don't, don't use them if you don't need to. You know, try and see if there's other ways to do it because those are the things that will affect performance. And they change the way index usage and everything is used. Now, what I mean by there's always more than one way to get the same results, when you're designing an application, design has a big factor on application performance. When you're designing an application, if you make something too normalized, where you have to query eight tables to get out simple informational data, that's going to cause problems later on. You know, there's other ways to do that. No matter what you do, no matter what you're writing, there's more than one way to do it. If you're trying to, if you have a process that, if you, have an up, if you need to write an update script that goes out and now changes one flat table, you decided to normalize it into five different tables. You may write a process that runs, you know, and it grabs this information and it opens up a cursor or a CF loop, whatever, for every record, and then it dumps it into these other tables. There's other ways to do that. You know, usually you can do that with update join statements, things like that. There's always other ways to do it. Don't just think there's only way to, one way to do something. Take a step back and think about what's another way I could do this. And sometimes that will save you. Indexing. Understand different types of indexes. Keep it simple. Don't go buck wild once you learn about indexes and go put 20 fields on one index. Keep it simple. Just put simple indexes where you need them. If you've got you know, two fields on a where clause, put those two fields in an index. It's pretty simple. Sometimes indexing can decrease performance. As much as we talk about indexing and what it can do, sometimes it can cause a problem. Yes? Yes, yes, very good point. Um, what he said was, when you're, depending on when your query, when you have a query, if you just have a simple query and you have two columns in your where clause, like for example, if you just have get all the parks that are in, that are in the U.S. and are government-related parks, you know, something like that. Um, if you if you change the way, you know, I usually try and put the most restrictive one first. You know, first put if. If you know that there's a lot less parks to have a slide than there are parks in the US, you know, flip those. Put the most restrictive one first, and that's going to help you. And one thing he just mentioned was if, you, if one of your columns is on index and one's not, and it happens to be the one that's the second one in your query, so if you have the first thing in your query is not hit an index, it's going to do a full table scan. So on what is a table scan or an index scan, these things I keep talking about, we're going to talk about those. View how the execution is affected. Every time you change an index, view how it's affected. Index hints. There, are, there is a way to force a certain index on a query. I don't recommend it. I never do it. It can cause problems because generally the database was built for a certain reason, and it's, it's smarter than we are on knowing what indexes need to be used and things like that. Index maintenance is important. These indexes need to be, be maintained. Clustered index. Clustered index, there's one per table. Primary key is usually the clustered index. Mainly that's because it's, you know, by default, like if you're creating it in SQL Server, by default, when you make a primary key, it's clustered. You know, that's usually what it is. Data is physically ordered by, by index and gets reordered when it's updated. So clustered index, the data is physically ordered somewhere else in another file, 
and it's updated every time you do an insert or an update or a delete. Now that's what I mean by it can affect performance. Because if you have a table like an audit log table or something like that that you're constantly inserting into or updating every single transaction, you know, if you have a big clustered index on this table, that may cause a problem. It may actually slow it down. So there is a, a, a problem, there is a factor there where you've got to think. You can't just go crazy and put indexes on everything because sometimes it can have a, have a, have a negative effect. Non-clustered index, these are the things that I use most often, you know, because you can only have one clustered index per table. If it's select data, things that you don't, you know, you're not constantly inserting and deleting like crazy, I generally recommend to have a clustered index in every single table. That helps keep it ordered, it helps prevent bookmark lookups, things like that. Non-clustered index, you can have as many non-clustered indexes as you want on one table. You know, I, I don't recommend going crazy and having 50 on one table because it's going to confuse it when it has to pick what indexes to use for what columns. But you can have multiple indexes. You can have one index that's on three different fields that you use in a query all the time. You can have one index that's on one field that you use in many different places. There's different ways of doing that. And the data is not physically ordered. Because you may notice when you when you are using when it's using a non-clustered index, it actually has to go back to the either the table or the clustered index to grab that data because it's not actually physically ordered in there. Use indexes on fields matched in your where clause. So if you're looking at a query, you've got fields in your where clause, things used in joins, fields used in order by clauses, fields used in group by clauses. Look at those because that's going to help you determine what to put your indexes on. Don't put indexes on everything, and indexes aren't really going to help you when it's on a field that's using a like search because that's going to force a table scan anyways. Index maintenance. Here are the things that you use for index maintenance. Indexes get fragmented and they need to be maintained on a regular basis. DBCC DB reindex. That's a command that actually drops and recreates index. It actually reindexes that index. It keeps it nice and keeps it from being fragmented. DBCC index defrag. That's another one that actually fragment, defragments the index and moves it onto separate pages. Because when you have a big index, it may eventually take up you know, 50, 50 pages or 5,000 pages or whatever it is. And after a while, those become kind of fragmented. And they're like 50% full or whatever it is. And when you do an index defrag, it's actually going to take them and create them out and clean them up and put them back in order. Um, update statistics. This is something where I mentioned the database engine uses statistics to know what to do. Yes. The, the DBCC commands. Um, those, when you do like an index defrag or, um, or a reindex, you can run them without you know, shutting down everything, but don't run them during the day because it does create locks when you're doing this. It does actually lock the tables up when you're doing a reindex or an index defrag. So don't do them during the day, you know, do them at night. I recommend doing them weekly. I recommend doing them on a weekly basis. Yes? Good question. Um, are they complementary? Do you need to do both all the time? The difference of index defrag or DB reindex? What's the difference? DB reindex is the one I usually do first. That usually takes care of the problems. That's the most simple way. What it does is it drops the index and recreates it. It usually fixes the problem. Index defrag is the next step that will actually physically take this, de this index and move it around and put it on the new pages. So that I don't do all the time. I do that if there's a problem. or Maybe I'll do that once a month. The reindex is the one I do first. Um, take advantage of stored objects. Use procedures and views and functions. You know, these are these use cache execution plans, and the database knows what it's doing when you call a procedure. It's done this before. It recognizes it. It's, co it's compiled. It's going to run faster. Don't overanalyze. Don't think too hard and think, oh, I got to do this and this and this and this. I got to do all this crazy stuff just to do something simple. That's very common after you've been doing things for a while. You think too hard and overanalyze. You know, take a step back. Keep something simple. Don't, I mean, like for example, you know, just to, I still do this. A few months ago, I was working on something where it was running, this little query was running slow, and it wasn't just a little query, it was a procedure. The store procedure was running pretty slow, and it was doing a lot of different transactions in it. And first thing I did was rewrite the query. I rewrote the store procedure, thinking, oh, this is, 
this is messy, you know, I need to rewrite this procedure. It took me like a few hours to rewrite this procedure. And then when I rewrote it, it didn't really speed it up. It was still slow. And I looked at it, oh, there's no indexes on the tables. You know, if I would have just looked at that first, it would have fixed the problem. So always think index and keep things simple. Don't overanalyze. Don't, you know, go too full into it without thinking about your options. Your execution plan is your everyday tool. This is something that you're going to use every single day. This is going to be your best friend. It provides an outline of the execution and it returns what the database did and it returns information that you can see can cause performance problems. There's two different ways of doing this. There's an estimated execution plan which shows what the database is going to do. This doesn't take into effect certain things like network usage or other things going on at the time. Um, there's an actual execution plan. Run and get the execution plan. This will return the actual execution plan used. The actual thing that it did. It'll run the query and then it'll return exactly what it did. So let's look at a couple of these real quick. Um, first, some tips on reading plans. Um, each of the piece represents, represents some step that it did. The biggest tip I can give you on execution plans is re read them from right to left. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. So this query, for example, I just, run, just want to run this query. Um, here's an option that says include actual ex ex execution plan. Here's an option to display estimated execution plan. I do this, it's just going to display the estimated execution plan. I need to be using the right database first. Okay, so here's my estimated execution plan. And it's just a simple query, right? But it's doing parallelism, it's doing all this kind of stuff, hash, match. What, what is all this stuff? You know, more parallelism, index scan, index scan. The good thing here is you didn't see, well, there's one table scan. A table scan is bad. You want to watch out for table scans. Return type is array. Like we